afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking regarding the charitable status of university commercial activities. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. There are no plans to review the charitable status of universities or their commercial activities. The Scottish Government responded to the recent Barclay review on the 12th of September and indicated it will undertake further engagement on the recommendation to remove charity rates relief from certain types of university activity. Barclay was clear that the recommendation did not relate to core functions of universities, including education provisions and research and development. Barclay was also clear that they were not recommending the charitable status should be removed from universities. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for her response. The Scottish Government is still consulting on the decision whether to remove the charitable status on commercial elements of universities as laid out in the Barclay Review. But can the Minister com comment on the advice that she has taken to date on this and whether it has considered the financial impacts it will have on universities and local communities in an era of very tight local government budgets? Minister. Well, as Mr Mackay set out when he responded to the Barclay Review, the Scottish Government will undertake a thorough consultation on this and some other recommendations within that uh, review. I'm sure that both myself and Mr Mackay will have numerous conversations with universities in Scotland and with different institutions to seek their views, and I look forward to taking part in that process. Question number two, Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has with Inverness College UHI. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government is engaging regularly with Inverness College, along with four other colleges, as part of the College's Improvement project, project on Retention and Attainment. The Scottish Funding Council also engages with Inverness College as part of the University of the Highlands and Islands through the annual outcome agreement process. Marie Todd. I thank the Minister for that answer. In a recent newspaper article, the new Principal and Chief Executive of Inverness College UHI, Professor Chris O'Neill, said the cloud of uncertainty about the nature of the final Brexit deal did, meant he didn't, still did not know what he was going to have to do to support his EU colleagues and UHI's cohort of 374 EU students. Expressing particular fears for the future of science industries, he said it was interesting that Brexit leader David Davis was talking about the way in which he wants to negotiate a relationship with Europe that preserves our extraordinary capacity to attract and to develop world-class science. UHI is, of course, a university which would not have come into existence without EU support. Does the Minister agree with Professor O'Neill's description of the UK's decision to leave the EU as a tragedy? Minister. Well, yes, I would agree with the, the principal's statements. And while we welcome the UK government's wish to continue to participate in EU science and innovation programmes, it's very difficult to see how our institutions are going to do that effectively without continued freedom of movement for our academics, our researchers and our students. And I'm afraid this is yet another example of that lack of long-term planning and the joined-up thinking around the UK government's um, decisions around uh, Brexit. When you combine that with the, the UK government student visa policies um, and with their intention uh, to, to still uh, tighten the grip on um, immigration for international students, that does continue to send a negative message to students considering Scotland for their studies. And that's something the Scottish government is determined to work against. Thank you. Richard Lyle, question three. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, I refer members to my register of interests and the convener of the Showman's Cross-Party Group and only member of the Showman's Guild Scotland. To ask the Scottish Government what action it takes when drafting educational documentation, equality monitoring and learning tools to ensure that show people are considered. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, as part of our commitment to excellence and equity in education and in planning and policy development processes, we routinely consider the needs of a wide range of stakeholders and groups. A recent example is the work to develop guidance for improving the educational outcomes of children and young people from travelling cultures. My officials worked with a diverse group of stakeholders with a breadth of experience and skills in working with a range of travellers to prepare the draft guidance which has been consulted upon. My officials made sure that the Scottish Showman's Guild were aware of the consultation and invited their input, met with them directly to hear their views as part of the consultation exercise. 
Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and, and for the work that is carrying out with the Showman's Guild. Through my work as the Showman's Guild uh, convener, I frequently came across issues relating to representation of show people on formal uh, school documents. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically what further guidance and action can be taken by the Scottish Government to deliver for show people by ensuring that they are represented as an ethnic group, they are not travellers, they are not gypsies, on relevant school records and documentation. Cabinet Secretary. So, so some of the issues that uh, Mr Lyle raises in this respect um, are material for the decisions around the composition of the census, for example, which is a responsibility of the Registrar General for Scotland. I'll ensure that the Registrar General uh, hears the points that Mr Lyle has made. Um, these issues were touched upon during the meeting that I had with Christine Stirling, the Education Officer of the Showman's Guild, with uh, Mr Lyle back on the 15th of March. Um, uh, having said all that I've said there about the, um, the, the classification issues that are involved, um, I want to assure Mr Lyle that the Additional Support for Learning Act places duty on duties on education authorities to identify, provide for and review the additional support needs of their pupils, whatever the reason is for that support. And the Act does not require a child to be identified as belonging to any particular defined group for those duties to apply. So the, the, the issues and concerns that Mr Lyle raises should be taken into account by the provision that is designed to fulfil the statutory obligations on local authorities in terms of the Additional Support for Learning Act. Question number four, Jeremy Balfour. To ask the Scottish Government when it will review its guidance on mobile phone use in primary schools. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, the Scottish Government currently has no plans to review its guidance on mobile phone use in schools. We urge schools and local authorities to think carefully about how they can best utilise mobile phones to enhance education, whilst also educating learners about their appropriate use. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? Will he be aware that two studies have identified the risk of allowing primary school children access to mobile phones while attending school? Research carried out by the London School of Economics found that schools with restricted access to mobile experience average improved their test score by 14.2%. In the USA, it shows that children between 8 and 11 are significantly more likely to be victims of cyber bullies if they own a mobile phone and take it to school. Based on these and other findings, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's now time to ban mobile phones in all primary schools in this country? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I, I don't share that opinion. Um, I think the research that Mr Balfour cites in the London School of Economics um, it does indicate what he ascribed to the research, but it also noted that it's possible that structured use of mobile phone technology can enhance learning and teaching. And the fundamental point comes down to the appropriate use and the arrangements that are put in place for um, mo appropriate mobile phone use within our school system. Um, I don't think that should be prescribed from St Andrew's House. I think that should be decided by teachers in the classrooms of our schools, and they should have the freedom to determine um, what is the appropriate um, approach to take and how mobile phones can contribute towards enhancing the learning environment. Now, Mr Balfour raises a, a significant issue, which is about the exposure to cyberbullying, which I don't in any way um, uh, minimise. Uh, the, the, there is a significant point to be addressed here, where, as a government, we need to be part of the education process to equip young people with the resilience to be able to resist um, any bullying that takes place in whatever circumstance, but uh, particularly in relation to this question, in a cyberspace, um, and then also to make sure that young people are educated in the proper and effective use of technology which can enhance their learning opportunities. Um, and that is the way the government will take forward these issues. Question five has not been lodged. Question six, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the number of teacher training places at the University of Aberdeen in the current academic year compares with last year. Uh, Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. President Officer, student teacher intake targets are agreed annually between the Scottish Funding Council and universities. This agreement is dependent on capacity within individual universities and subject requirements. The number of initial teacher education places available at the University of Aberdeen in the current academic year is 578 compared to 565 in 2016. 
Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He will know that the number of postgraduate places for primary teachers has been reduced this year across Scotland, including six a loss, a very disappointing reduction of six places at the University of Aberdeen. Can he undertake today that there will be no further reduction in the number of primary education training places at Aberdeen, and also that the workforce planning model used for this purpose will take proper account of the continuing challenge in recruiting and retaining primary teachers in the North and North East? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, certainly, I give Mr Macdonald the assurance on the last point that he, he raises that um, the uh, workforce planning model will be designed to address the requirements for recruitment into the teaching profession around the country. Uh, that is a model that is informed by a variety of different strands of information, some of them about uh, the number of pupils that we anticipate to have within our schools, um, the level of retirement uh, from the profession, the level of voluntary exits from the profession, and a variety of other factors that are borne in mind as part of that process. Um, and the workforce planning model then drives the decisions that are made about the initial teacher education intake into individual institutions. Um, so the, the, the work is undertaken um, openly and comprehensive with a range of information sources to enable us to arrive at the best assessment of the level of intake that would be appropriate. And that's the model that's applied in every year and it will be applied in future years into the bargain. Ash Denham. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what impact the Teaching Makes People campaign has had on the profession and whether recent trends show an increase in the proportion of post-probationer teachers in employment? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, in the last year, the increase in the teacher intake um, uh, as a consequence of all of our efforts, which included the Teaching Makes People campaign, um, was a 19% increase in PGD students into Scottish universities compared to the previous year. And the current campaign has resulted in a 21% increase in STEM undergraduates considering teaching as a profession. Um, so the efforts that we've put into promoting and uh, uh, encouraging, promoting the profession and encouraging individuals to see teaching as an opportunity to transform the life chances of individuals um, is proving successful. Um, in relation to the point on post probationer employment, um, I can share with the Chamber that the census has indicated that the proportion, the percentage of post probationer teachers in employment increased from 58% in 2010 to 87% in 2016. So a significant increase um, in post probationer employment. Thomas Mason. Thank you, convener. Uh, Minister, you promised that the class sizes would be no more than 20, 25 in secondary schools, and recently it's been reported that, uh, that the number of classes over 30 have gone up by 25%. Have you any comment on this, and is the teacher places that you say are going to be filled, coming from the colleges, going to be fulfilled to reduce that gap sufficiently so that this generation of children will not be dis dis disadvantaged? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Clearly, presiding officer, the uh, recruitment into the teaching profession is a significant priority for the government. It is for that reason that the um, level of um, uh, places available at uh, initial, te in, is, initial teacher education settings has increased by 77% since 2010. So the government is making determined efforts to ensure that we have the appropriate number of teachers in our schools. Um, we work with local authorities, as I explained in my answer to Mr Macdonald a moment ago, uh, to identify the appropriate number of teachers that need to be recruited to ensure that we have an adequate supply. I'm of course aware that there are challenges in certain subjects and in certain areas of the country, and for that reason the government has put in place a number of specific measures which are designed to encourage uh, individuals to come in to teach the STEM subjects, uh, for individuals to come in to teach home economics and for individuals to come in to teach English. And we will continue in assessing the scale of the workforce to be driven by the information and data that comes from our dialogue with local authorities in the recruitment of teachers. 
Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could clarify whether teacher trainer, trainer applications uh, now include the SIMD data, the SIMD data, in respect of the criteria for widening access to universities. Is that now something that is used in assessing whether an undergraduate gets a place or not? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, obviously, the, the, the approach on widening access is um, an, approach, an agenda which is comprehensive across all areas of the, uh, the recruitment into our universities. Uh, there will not be specific targets in relation to uh, the teaching profession, but there will be um, particular objectives that the Commission on Widening Access set for us across the range of uh, different uh, institutions. Uh, as Mr Scott will be av uh, aware, the Scottish Funding Council just on Tuesday published the uh, information which the Commission on Widening Access asked it to uh, produce on the approach to widening access that will now become an annual source of reporting on a transparent basis and obviously um, ministers are encouraging institutions to engage strongly on the widening access agenda. It's a central part of the uh, guidance letter that the Minister for Higher and Further Education has issued to the sector and will be the subject of scrutiny as part of progress on the fulfilment of outcome agreements uh, by institutions. Thank you. Question number seven, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many foundation apprenticeships there are. Uh, Minister Jamie Hepburn. We are committed to providing up to 5,000 foundation apprenticeship places by 2019. Uh, this year, we are already expanding the availability of foundation apprenticeships and are ensuring they are available in all local authority areas. Foundation apprenticeships are an additional choice for every pupil who sees the value in work-based learning. They are a, a new way for young people to learn with the chance to get a head start in a career by gaining industry-recognised qualifications, working on real projects and real experience that employers look for. The programme is designed to provide a challenging vocational learning experience with a focus on developing skills that employers and learners need for 2016-18. There were a total of 354 foundation apprenticeship starts registered by the end of September 2016. It will be in a position in the coming weeks to confirm the number of requested starts for 2017-19 foundation apprenticeships. Gail Ross. I thank the Minister for that answer. The developing the young workforce in the foundation apprenticeship scheme is bringing together schools, colleges and the business sector to give young people more opportunities both when they are at school and when they leave. Can the Minister tell me are there any barriers to accessing foundation apprenticeships and are there any plans to introduce them in other sectors? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Well, Ms Ross uh, mentions the Developing Young Workforce uh, initiative, and of course that's a, a critical element of our ensuring pupils come out of uh, school better prepared for uh, the world of work. It does indeed uh, involve close engagement between uh, employers. Ms Ross is quite right to, to talk about the business sector. Of course, there's across uh, all uh, sectors, public, private and uh, third uh, sector, but to, to bring close engagement between employers and the educational uh, environment. I've been very fortunate and privileged to go to the Highlands and Islands to to see some of the great work that they're doing. Uh, they're not uh, Ms Ross's specific area. If she would like me to visit there, I'd be very happy to. Uh, foundation apprenticeships are a, a critical element of our development young workforce uh, offer. There are around 400 uh, foundation uh, apprentices uh, being, uh, foundation apprenticeship places being provided in the Highlands and Islands uh, this uh, year. Uh, it's an increasingly important uh, offer. We are determined not only to, to grow the number of foundation uh, apprenticeships, but also the number of opportunities there are presently 10 uh, frameworks uh, in place. Uh, there will shortly be 12 from 2018. There will be two new frameworks in accountancy and food and drink operations. So uh, I think that demonstrates the, the commitment that we have to this uh, scheme presiding officer and our determination to further embed it as an important part of the school experience. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, it was interesting to hear the minister's reply to the question because uh, unlike modern apprenticeships, no statistics or numbers are published on a regular quarterly or even annual basis for foundation apprenticeships or indeed graduate apprenticeships uh, either. So will the Minister undertake to ensure that that information is made available as the programme develops? Minister. Uh, yes, I will. Jamie Halker johnson Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm glad the Minister mentions the Highlands and Islands. Um, unlike the two pilot projects, uh, where there were seven choices, young people in Kirkwall, Lowick, Stornoway and Thurso have only two subject choices. Uh, while those in Elgin currently only have three. Can the Minister assure me that the Scottish Government is committed to increasing the subject choices available for young people in Scotland's remote and rural communities? Minister. Yes, I can. Admirably brief. 
Uh, question number eight, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the Scottish Government how many care experienced and accommodated young people are eligible for continuing care and how this compares with the number actually receiving it? Mr Mark MacDonald. Uh, since 1st April 2015, 16-year-olds who have been looked after in foster, kinship or residential care have been eligible for continuing care. Uh, entitlement is being increased annually for this initial group of eligible young people until they reach the age of 21. Thereafter, all young people who are in these care placements will be eligible for continuing care between 16 and 21. The first full year of data on continuing care will be published in the National Statistics publication Children's Social Work Statistics in 2019. We will consider that data and other information from local authorities to consider what is working well and what more we might need to do to ensure that looked after young people are able to exercise their right to choose to continue living in care until 21. Kezia Dugdale. I thank the Minister for that answer and I was incredibly proud of this Parliament when it introduced the continuing care provision. So I did my own freedom of information request into how well that was going and asked all of Scotland's 32 local authorities about it. So far 20 have replied showing that there are 3,177 young people eligible for continuing care but only 177 are actually receiving it. That's 99% of people eligible to receive this provision not getting it. Well the Minister therefore agreed to sit down and look at the findings of this FOI with me and see what we can do collectively together to increase uptake of this continuing care provision. Minister. Presiding officer, um, I am more than happy to meet with Kezia Dugdale. I'm aware she's tabled a number of written questions in relation to this as well. And I know this is an area on which um, she worked extremely constructively with my predecessor during the passage of the 2014 Act. So I can give her that assurance. Uh, what I would say is that we also have to remember that as well as the uh, continuing care, there's also after care uh, as well. And the, the estimate that we made in the 2014 Act was that we estimated an approximate uptake of around 74 placements per year but I'm more than happy to sit down look at some of the detail that she has received in her FOI responses uh, obviously we're awaiting the comprehensive picture from the national statistics uh, before we start thinking about different approaches that might need to be taken but I'm more than happy to discuss that with Kezia Dugdale. Question number nine Jamie Green. Government, what action it is taking to ensure that young people from Scotland are not limited in their ability to go to university? Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that all of our young people have an equal chance of going to university. That's why we established the Commission on Widening Access and why we have accepted all 34 of its recommendations in full. Good progress on the implementation of those recommendations is being made, with all five of the Commission's foundational recommendations either delivered or on track for delivery by the recommended dates. This includes a full bursary for students with a care experience and the appointment of the Commissioner for Fair Access in December last year. I have also established the Access Delivery Group, which will coordinate and monitor progress on the implementation of the recommendations across all parts of the education system. This group brings together all of those who are responsible for delivering the recommendations, those leading delivery projects and other key stakeholders. Jamie Green. I thank the Minister for that response. But, Presiding Officer, we already know that twice as many students from disadvantaged areas in England are going to university compared to in Scotland. And now we learn that the number of Scottish students enrolling at the University of Edinburgh has actually fallen with a 20% rise in admission from fee-paying students from the rest of the UK. Given that the number of Scottish students admitted is capped by the Scottish Funding Council, what is, this, what is the Minister doing to ensure that Scottish students are not being left behind? Minister. Well, that's why I was pleased that the total number of Scottish domiciled full-time first-degree university entrants rose by 12% from 25,790 in 2006-07 to 28,770 in 2015-16. Regardless, I am not complacent about the need to ensure that every young person in Scotland um, has the opportunity to apply for a university um, and receive a place. That's why we are taking widening access very seriously um, within my role and we'll continue to do so. Colin Beatty. Can the Minister advise how student death levels differ here in Scotland under an SNP government compared to those in England under a Tory government and in Wales under a Labour administration? Minister. The latest student loan company figures published on the 15th of June this year show that in England, under the Conservatives, an average student loan debt has risen to 32,220 and in Wales, under Labour, 19,280. In Northern Ireland, the average debt is nearly 21,000. By contrast, Scotland has the lowest average student loan debt by some considerable margin at 11,740. 
I am not complacent around student debt, however, as well as widening access. The government is taking um, a serious look at this. That's why we have established the independent review looking into student report, and I look forward to receiving the recommendations from the independent review later this year. Ian Gray. Removing barriers to access to university is important, but so is support to complete courses. The Funding Council tell us that 13% of students from the most disadvantaged families drop out of university, uh, and that's almost twice the equivalent percentage for those from the most affluent backgrounds. So will the Minister undertake to restore her government's cuts to student grants to help poorer students to see their studies through to completion? Minister. Well, as I just said to the member in my previous answer, I await the recommendations of the independent review into student support. But I would point out the work that is already ongoing by this government to take retention very seriously. In our college sector, we've already developed a recruitment and retention um, improvement work with the, the colleges. And within universities, I made it very, very clear at the delivery group, when I chaired that delivery group, that retention was very, very important. They were looking for widening access, not to freshers' fair, but to graduation. That point was taken up by the, the delivery group and we'll look for that in our work programme. Question number 10, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how it will support the Respect Me Anti-Bullying Week in November 2017 to help promote respect for LBGTI people in schools. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, Anti-Bullying Week aims to raise awareness of bullying of children and young people in schools and elsewhere and to highlight ways of preventing and responding to it. Bullying of any kind, including homophobic, biphobic and transphobic, is entirely unacceptable and must be addressed swiftly and effectively whenever it arises. The theme for this year's Anti-Bullying Week is to promote difference and equality in schools with the tagline, All Different, All Equal. Um, the Scottish Government and Education Scotland will be encouraging young people, practitioners, parents and carers to share what respect means to them on so social media. In addition, Respect Me will be undertaking a number of activities during Anti-Bullying Week including organising a conference which will create a forum in which to showcase, share and discuss different examples of anti-bullying practice. James Dornan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that while Scotland has made great progress towards respecting members of the LBGTI community, the Scottish Government's policies can and must continue to help create a more positive and respectful culture to help eradicate bullying both in and out of the school place? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly associate the government with those aspirations, Presiding Officer, and the work that we take forward is designed to support that agenda. The findings of the most recent Scottish Social Attitude Survey shows that discriminatory attitudes towards transgender people in Scotland are on the decline. Um, we have taken forward a number of different policy steps in this respect, and we will continue on that agenda during this Parliament. Um, the progress made towards inclusion for all is uh, the heart of our education agenda and I obviously have taken a number of steps uh, including the establishment of the Inclusive Education Working Group to uh, provide some of the steps forward that will be necessary to address this important question. Annie Wills. Thank you, Presiding Officer. New figures show that cyber sex crime offending numbers have jumped by 50% in the last three years with the analysis showing the medium age of victims to be 14. How will Respect Me Anti-Bullying Week incorporate spreading awareness of this subject? Cabinet Secretary. It's, that approach will be at the heart of the approach on Anti-Bullying Week. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in a summit on ed education issues in relation to sexual crime, which was organised by the Solicitor General for Scotland in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago. And it was a, a very, very effective opportunity to bring together a number of interested parties. And the crucial point that was made about uh, in the whole day was the importance of education and prevention to equip young people with the knowledge to avoid getting into the situation of either being the victims of or the perpetrators of such sexual crimes. Because obviously that can end up in the criminal justice system with very damaging outcomes, as we all know. But the, the heart of the professional advice that was been given to that summit was the importance of education and prevention to avoid those negative outcomes happening. So I'm very happy to 
assure Annie Wells of the importance the government attaches to that. And I'm grateful to the, the Solicitor General for taking the initiative to establish that uh, summit and to bring together uh, officials from different disciplines, not just in the criminal justice system, to work collaboratively to try to address this issue. Kenny, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my first day at secondary school, the smallest boy in my class ran over to the tallest, jumped up and headbutted him without provocation, knocking him to the ground. Bullying can be inflicted on people, causing them great pain and distress for a host of reasons, from how they look, behave, because of a speech impediment, religion, ethnicity or sexual orientation. But in this parliament, it seems we seek to elevate the latter over all other sorts of bullying. I'm pleased that the cabinet secretary agrees that all bullying is wrong. Does he also agree that schools should do more to deter and deal with bullying, regardless of who's being bullied and why they're being bullied? Cabinet Secretary. We, one of the fundamental characteristics of our education system, which is essential if young people are to learn effectively, is that they must at all times feel safe in their schools. And if we don't have that safety and that feeling of safety for young people in our schools, then the prospects of young people being able to learn will be diminished as a consequence. So I accept the fundamental premise of Mr Gibson's question that it is important that uh, bullying is tackled in any circumstance in which it prevails uh, for whatever cause because it will undermine the personal esteem of the young people involved and it will affect their learning capability. And that has the potential to blight the life chances of young people and our education system is focused on enhancing and fulfilling the life chances of our young people. Question number 11, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to provide additional funding for the Schools for the Future programme to allow Phase 2 of the Dumfries Learning Town project to go ahead. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, through the £1.8 billion Scotland School for the Future programme, Dumfries and Galloway Council has been awarded significant funding of £24.5 million towards the North West Campus and St Joseph's College which form part of Dumfries Learning Town and also to Dobiti High School. Um, we recognise there is more work that is to be done in the school estate and that is why we will bring forward new proposals to build on the success of the programme. Options are currently being developed and we will announce details later this year. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The projects the Cabinet Secretary mentions, the new North West Dumfries campus, Dolbiti uh, Academy, are of course phase one of that project. Phase two proposes a new Dumfries High School, the refurbishment of Dumfries Academy, a new Lorburn, Lorinal and Noble Hill, Noble Hill Primary, not to mention the innovative work taking place with partners in business and furthering higher education to make Dumfries truly the learning town. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the project will transform education in Dumfries and will he ensure that phase two becomes a reality by making it a priority for future government funding? Cabinet Secretary. I'm very familiar with these um, issues. Um, I visited Dumfries High School just the other week there and I saw uh, the work that is being undertaken on the Dumfries Learning Town project and was briefed uh, on that. And I recognise the uh, very good work that's been done at local level to advance such a proposition. As I indicated in my earlier answer, uh, we are considering the options in relation to the development of the Schools for the Future programme and further announcements will be made in due course by the government when those uh, details are to hand. Uh, but I hear the points made about the Defeat Learning Town proposal. Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I uh, share the aspirations uh, for learning from uh, the, the member from the Labour benches? But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that there will be far more opportunity for these kind of developments where we're not saddled with the private finance debt um, left by the Labour government um, now costing Scottish taxpayers over £1 billion a year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, we certainly are saddled with a tremendous amount of PFI debt and uh, the government has to service that debt along with our local authority partners. Um, and of course, the uh, investment that the government is making is designed to create a sustainable school estate and it certainly would have been more sustainable if we hadn't been burdened with the obligations of PFI that were bequeathed us by the Labour Party. Question number 12, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is investing and in supporting young people in Paisley. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Improving the education and life chances of children and young people is the defining mission of this government. The Scottish Government 
It's providing a range of support to young people in Paisley aimed at improving educational outcomes and employment prospects. The Scottish Attainment Challenge is this year providing almost £7.8 million of extra resources for schools in Renfrewshire through pupil equity funding and the Challenge Authorities Programme, which provides support to schools supporting children and young people living in communities affected by high levels of deprivation. In addition, Renfrewshire Council receives £275,000 from the Innovation Fund in 2016-17 which was used in schools to continue to build on approaches already making a difference, such as family learning projects both within schools and in partnership with the local authority and external partners. Since April 2017, there have been 140 modern apprenticeship starts and more than 90 starts under the Employability Fund in Renfrewshire. As of June 2017, there are almost 650 apprentices in training in the area, and the Community Jobs Scotland programme has 32 employers in the Renfrewshire area, and more than 160 people have benefited from a job training opportunity. George Adam. Thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister agree with me that initiatives like Invest in Renfrewshire, which recently relocated to Paisley's historic Russell Institute building in the town centre, along with Skills Development Scotland, and it's part funded by the European Social Fund, is a perfect example of how training and resulting skills can encourage employment and employability, uh, which can be sustained in towns like Paisley? Minister. Well, uh, indeed, I suppose the, I'm aware of uh, the Invest uh, in Renfrewshire uh, initiative and also its uh, recent relocation and co-location with Skills Development Scotland. I suppose the best way of demonstrating its success is that when the uh, programme was launched, uh, I understand, in July 2012, uh, Renfrewshire was 27th out of the 32 local authorities for youth employment, and it's currently uh, fourth in Scotland. And Renfrewshire saw the biggest youth employment growth in Scotland for three years running, so that has to speak uh, somewhat of its uh, success. Also, uh, I'm uh, hugely enthusiastic about the the recent initiative of uh, co-locating with Skills Development Scotland uh, at the uh, Russell uh, Institute. This is uh, a good approach, uh, building on the success of uh, the Invest in Renfrewshire uh, approach and utilising the skill set of Skills Development Scotland. Uh, George Adam correctly identified that there have been uh, EU funds utilised for uh, the uh, Invest in Renfrewshire initiative. Of course, we know there is a significant concern around the long-term uh, uh, funding prospects as a result of uh, Brexit, and we continue to look for clarity on that particular matter from the UK Government. Question 13, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to recent research from Bath Spa University, suggesting that exposure to high levels of organisational change without listening to the views of teachers is contributing to extremely poor working conditions for teachers in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government welcomes all discussion on how to improve conditions for teachers in Scotland and we will give this report full consideration. We want to create a world-class education system that helps all of our children to succeed and of course highly skilled, motivated and appropriately rewarded teaching professionals are an integral part of that. The Scottish Government has been working with teachers, teacher trade unions, local authorities and other partners to address concerns around workload levels and this will continue to be a key theme of our education reforms. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This report isn't the only one to say it. In fact, it wasn't even the only one in the week it was published to say this. The Scottish Government's own international education advisors, as well as academics who responded to their consultation, have indicated that organisational reform, there's no evidence that that links directly to improved education outcomes. Why, when those in the education sector are so hostile to the government's reforms, when academics say there's an evidence for them, are the government not taking an evidence-led approach to education reform? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the government is taking an evidence-led approach to education reform and we engage strongly in the pursuit of that objective. The evidence suggests that a greater empowerment for schools will significantly enhance the performance of our education system and school empowerment is at the heart of the government's education reform agenda to ensure that more decisions affecting the learning of young people can be taken as close as possible to those young people. Uh, I'm also taking uh, an evidence-led approach in relation to the question of um, the provision of professional and pedagogical support to the school community, where the professional associations have been quite clear that the regional collaboration proposed by the government um, will be of assistance in strengthening that uh, assistance to professional practice. So the government will continue to engage with all interested parties on this agenda, but our objectives are clear to ensure that we strengthen the effectors of the education system by putting in place a greater professional support and by empowering the teaching profession. Question 14, Miles Briggs. Yes, the plans it has to expand the number of places at medical schools for Scottish domiciled students. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. 
We are committed to building a sustainable medical workforce for the future and welcome students from Scotland, the rest of the UK and EU who want to study and work here. We're taking action both to increase the supply of Scottish medical school graduates and to retain those graduates working in NHS Scotland. The Scottish Government has invested £23 million in a medical education package. This has increased medical undergraduate places by 50 from 2016. And Scotland's first graduate medical entry programme, ScotGen, will commence next year, creating an additional 40 places. Part one of the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan, published in June, commits to a further increase in undergraduate numbers of 50 to 100 over the course of this parliamentary term. Miles Bridge. Does the Minister accept that under the SNP Government, the percentage of Scottish domicile students studying clinical medicine has now fallen sharply from almost two thirds to just 50% and that too many bright young Scots are being denied the chance to actually study medicine at Scottish universities? Given Ministers themselves now acknowledge that Scottish domiciled me medical students are more likely than others to choose to work in our NHS when they qualify, will this Scottish Government urgently look at this matter and show that more Scottish students are able to study medicine in our universities. Minister. Well, whilst the Scottish Government sets the annual intake into medicine in line with academic freedom, the selection and recruitment of individual students admitted to study medicine is a matter for individual universities. However, I did say to Miles Briggs in my original answer, the work that's already been undertaken by this Government to encourage and indeed um, ensure that we have further recruitment of Scottish domiciled um, students. That includes the increase in medical undergraduate places, the introduction of a graduate entry medical programme and the introduction of a pre medical entry programme focused on students from socially deprived backgrounds. This government is already taking action on this area. Thank you very much and that concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on air quality, delivering improvements for public health and the environment. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions. And I would ask any members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary to press their request to speak buttons now.